So let's turn now to looking at the humanity of Christ. We've been asking this Christological questions. We're studying Christology, the study of Christ. Is or was Jesus God? And we talked about that. And I think the overwhelming evidence in the New Testament is that the New Testament writers consider Jesus to be God. Now, I want to be up front, as I always do. Um, there will be people that will discredit the New Testament and say, can't trust it at all. I, I totally get that. The question we're asking here, we're, we're talking Christian theology. We're studying it from a Christian standpoint. We're using scripture um, as a, a, a reference. We're using it as the revealed word of God. So that's where we start. Totally concede. If you're not a Christian, you're, you're not going to start there. I get that. So please don't um, think that I'm not aware of that. But we're using scripture because we're doing Christian theology. We're not doing just theology of, of anything that refers to itself as God. We're doing Christian theology specifically systematic theology within Christianity. So Jesus is definitely God when it comes to the New Testament. The other question would be, is Jesus human? Um, and I think that most of us would probably go absolutely and, and wouldn't even think much about it. But I do think that since we're studying, we, we do need to be fair with the text and we need to uh, allow the text to, uh, to speak to us. And so where we learned with the, um, the deity of Christ, there were people that had issues with that that didn't see Jesus as being fully God, um, there were also people that had issues with Jesus being fully human. And so to that, we just want to know these, um, these categories. Docetism um, is, a, is a term that you need to know. Um, you'll see it in the early church writings. And if you study any type of church history, you need to know this. The docetics were people that believed that Jesus was divine. He was exclusively divine. They had no problem answering the question, was Jesus God? Where they had the problem was, is Jesus human? Um, they believed that he only appeared as human. In other words, he really wasn't there. It was almost like a um, almost like a, a mirage, um, a... Uh, a phantom, th that type of thing, that he appeared as human, but it, in fact, he, he, he wasn't human because th they believed um, sort of an underlying um, presupposition of docetism is dualism, which is you have the spirit or the spiritual side, and then you have matter. And of course, matter is evil and spiritual is good. And so this underlining dualism meant that Jesus could be spiritual. He could be divine, but he couldn't be human because taking on human form would be evil. And if you're, if you're committed to a dualistic thinking, then you understand how they, how they got there. Um, you can see, and it's not just against this, it's also against some forms of Gnosticism and and some of the other things that were going on in the first century and, and, and later, but you can definitely see that um, that John in his writings, and I, it's very, very, very important that you see this in First John, for instance, where he says that we have handled, we have seen, we have touched the word of life, that he, he wants his readers to understand that Jesus was a human being, that he came in the flesh. Um, you, you also see that John says, those who deny that Jesus came in the flesh um, are, are, are antichrist. You know, so, so there's, and, and, that, and that's, as we, in First John, we're dealing more with Gnosticism, um, but, but this uh, Docetism here that believed that Jesus um, was only divine, which comes out of a radical form of dualism, um, is, is something that you'll see in the early church when they're debating and trying to figure out who this, who this Jesus, in, in fact, was. There is another group, and um, we, we, we'll refer to these. Um, we call this Apollinarianism. Um, Apollinarianism is that Jesus was partly human. Um, and, and, and you can understand this because... If you've got one thing, and this is a hundred percent of this, how do you divide that up? You know, was there twenty percent here, and then this is eighty percent here? You know, how, how do you how do you deal with that? 
um, Apollinarianism, um, Apollinarianism believed that Jesus was partly human. And, and so reason I'm bringing up these words, not to just give you up big words or whatever, you, you'll see them in, in church history. The, the, the bigger point that I want you to see is that the struggle of Jesus being human or Jesus being God was something that the early church struggled with. And, and there were definitely camps and, and whatever, but we, we do have the Nicene Creed that, that sort of put this all together, which I do not think makes it right. It's just a creed. Um, what makes it right or wrong is scripture. And so when we say that was Jesus human, I think we have to go to scripture once again and ask what does the scripture say about, about, about Jesus? And I think that the scriptures imply that Jesus was completely human. Um, the humanity of Christ is so important in the New Testament. And I mean, again, we could spend a ton of time doing this, but I think just for this type of class, we want to just touch on some of the uh, um, underlying you know, things here that we need to know as people who want to understand theology and understand the things of God. And so when we're talking about Christology, we want to understand who Jesus was, that he was fully God and fully man. And we want to be able to give a reasonable defense for that, for those that would that would ask. Um, Jesus is specifically called a man. There's, there's no question about this. Um, Acts 2.22. We'll flip there in just a second. And John 8.40. Let's, let's look at those if you would. This is uh, um, Peter um, speaking on the day of Pentecost. He says, men of Israel, you know, when he says men of Israel, obviously he's talking about people. He's talking about you know, men. He says, hear these words. I want you to hear these words, you, you men of Israel. He's, he thinks they're human. He thinks they're, they're men. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. Um, here's Peter saying that Jesus is a man and nobody's going, no, he wasn't a man. He, he, we, we, you know, we, we poked our hands through him. He was like a holograph or whatever. No, they, they, they knew he was a man because he says that he crucified them. I mean, they, they knew he was a man. Th that you may go, well, that's, that, but that's important because in scripture, Jesus is referred to as a man. Um, let's, let's also look at John, John 8, 40 um, here. Uh, and if you'll flip there with me, um, John 8, 40, it says, it says, they had answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. But now, and this is verse 40, he says, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. And so here Jesus is referring to himself as a man and none of the group goes, no, you weren't a man. We, you know, we, we can see through you or whatever. There's this idea that scripture says that Jesus was a man. We also know that Jesus has what we would call human characteristics, things that make you and me human. Um, in John eleven thirty three, 33, um, this is the story of Lazarus. John 11, 33, if you will flip there with me um, in your Bible, or if you have an iPad or whatever it is, your phone, however you're using we have here in 1133, we have that it says when Jesus saw her weeping um, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Um, we consider those to be human emotions. Um, you could say those are emotions that God may have. Um, I, I don't know that we can really saddle God with emotions like you. I think scripture accommodates you and me and tells us things about God that we would call anthropomorphic, um, you know, uh, anthropos is man and morphe is form. They're, 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 they're forms of man that are attributed to God, but God's obviously not a man. He's, he's, he's greater than that. However, Jesus took on the form of humanity. That's, that's one of the things about Jesus that we know. And we know that as a man, he had emotions. It says that he was moved in his spirit. He was greatly troubled. You and me can, can relate to those things because those are human um, emotions. He has human limitations. 
um, in, in Matthew 4 and in Luke 4, both, we have the temptation of Jesus. And one of the things that we're told about Jesus is that after the 40 days was ended, he was hungry. Um, gods don't need their bellies filled, but Jesus did because he was a man. He was human. Um, in John 4, staying with this 4 pattern here, um, in John 4, he meets the woman at the well. And if you can recall, he was thirsty. So here's here we have him hungry in Matthew and Luke 4. And in John 4, we have him thirsty. Those are elements of being a person. They're elements of being a human. You know, and one of the things that we're asking, because we're studying Christology, is Jesus God and is Jesus man? What does that look like? What does the hypostatic union of both God and man look like? And what we're seeing is, is that the New Testament does not try to neatly fit all that together so that in a way that we can understand completely, it just merely says, this is who Jesus was. He was God. He was also a, a man. Um, he has human experiences. Um, and this is, once again, was Jesus human? Was he or was he just like a, a phantom? He looked like he was a human, but he really wasn't there because he was God. And if he was God, then he couldn't take on the form of man because it would be matter and it would be evil. No, we, we know that he has human experiences because we know in Luke 2.40, and then we're going to go to 2.52. So um, flip there with me to, to, to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to see some things about Jesus that once again show us that the New Testament writers are absolutely convinced that Jesus is a human being. Um, we, we, we see here that the child, verse 40, the child grew. So there's growth in Jesus. This is a human experience. He grew and he became strong and he was filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. This is, this is something that you would say about your kid if you were a Christian. You would say, hey, my kid grew. Hopefully they came to know the Lord. They grew in wisdom. They grew in favor. All of those great things. And then in 52 of Luke, it says, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature in favor with God and with man. There is an experience here that Jesus is having as a, as a human. He's, he's got human experiences. He's born. He, he, he develops. He matures. He learns. He becomes wiser. Um, those are not characteristics that we would refer to to God. God doesn't increase in knowledge. He doesn't increase in stature. He, he doesn't increase or decrease because to do that would mean that he's adding or subtracting, which means he's becoming more or becoming less. He's all of it at all times. He's infinite in all of his, his attributes. And so Jesus here is, is showing us not the attributes that we would consider to be deity, which we've talked about those earlier on. These are attributes of humanity which means that Jesus was, in fact, human. Um, and then we're told, and I think these are super um, important passages of Scripture to this understanding, um, 1 Timothy 2.5. We'll turn there in just a second. 1 Timothy 2.5. And we're also going to turn to Hebrews 2.17. So let's turn, if you would, would you turn with me to... Um, First uh, Timothy. Let's turn there. And we'll look at 2 5. It says, There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men. Who? The man Christ Jesus. Why, why is that important? Because it seems that this idea that Jesus is a man is part of who he is. He's, he is a man. The, the one that stands between God and men is a man, Christ Jesus. Now, we're, we go on to learn in 1 Timothy that Paul calls him God. He says, great is the, form of, great is the uh, mystery of godliness. Jesus was God, took the form of man. He, he's God. There's no question he's God. But Part of who he is is also being a human. Um, flip with me to, um, to Hebrews here, and we'll go to Hebrews 2.17, and we'll read it together. It says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers 
in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. So here, now we're told he had to be made, and this, this isn't like he was some toy that was, or some entity that was formed that wasn't there before. The point here is that he took on, um, he became the like his brothers. He, this, this was something that had to happen. Jesus had to be fully God. He had to be fully man or, or it wouldn't work. And so we can see here, I think, if we're, if we're being honest with ourselves from a Christian standpoint, we can see that Scripture teaches us that, that Jesus is both um, God and man, that there's a humanity and a divinity. And Scripture reveals both of these things. It reveals the humanity and the divinity. And so what do we do with this? Like, like so, you know, um, if that's the fact and that's so, then how does, how does that work? Well, um, the, the way we refer to orthodoxy, um, the way we refer to, um, you know, um, right belief um, as, as Christians as, as opposed to wrong belief is that Jesus has two natures but one person. Um, and again, these are we're starting now when we do these things, we start to start to strain the level of our understanding. But but remember, way, way, way back, we said that that reason would be our servant, but it would never be our master. And when reason and scripture part, we go with scripture. And so in the early church, um, there, there was a group called the Nestorians. And the Nestorians seem, as we can sort through their stuff that we have um, and, and know about them, uh, that, that Jesus was two people. And so the error of Nestorianism was in here. They, they, they saw that Jesus was fully God, fully man. So he was two people within, within one. Um, they deny the unity of the person. That's that's what they deny. And why is it important? What you need to know about Nestorians? No, but but we need to know that this stuff has been fleshed out in the church. Like this is not something new. Like if you're reading the Bible and you're like, man, I don't understand. Jesus is fully God, fully man. Does it mean he was like this? Is you're you're not struggling with something that the early church didn't struggle with. There were people that have struggled through everything that you and me would struggle with. And the beauty of this is it's already been struggled through. So, so we can we can understand how this all works and we can get to where we need to be without having to go through the years of fighting and all the stuff that, that have gone on. Um, they accept the two natures the Nestorians do. They accept that. Okay, but what they do not do um, is that they, they don't allow um, for the one person. That they have the two natures, but they want to keep distinct identities. Um, and that that doesn't work. So his divine nature does one thing in Nestorianism. Um, his human nature does something else. So it's almost a schizophrenic person in the hypostatic um, union. Um, there's another error in the um, early church when it comes to this. And we, we, we refer to this as Eutychianism. Again, I'm not as worried about you knowing these words. You need to write them down. You need to know them. But I'm, I'm more inclined that you understand the concepts, that the Nestorians believe that Jesus was two people, but he had two natures. And, and, and they, that one person, they couldn't, they couldn't get a hold of. They could get that he was God and man, but they couldn't understand that it was, there was a unity um, in the person. Um, the Eutychianism um, idea is that the divine and human nature were combined and blended together to form a new and unique distinctive nature. In, in other words, where the Nestorians said, I don't know that you can have one person and two natures. You, you need to have two people, two natures. Eutychianism said, no, there definitely was a person, but these two natures have been formed together in a way that they're no longer two 
natures. They're they're one, and it's a it's a sort of a, a blended together, um, distinctive um, nature. They affirm the unified person, but they undercut the distinctiveness and the ongoing character of the divine and human person. Um, you know, so there, there's going to be a, a, a real problem with either one of these things. And so um, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 um, has to deal with this type of stuff. So we had the, the council in Nicaea, but at the um, at, at Chalcedon in uh, 451, um, could be Chalcedon too. There's there's all kinds of ways to pronounce these words. Choose your choose the way that you want to do it. Um, Chalcedon, Chalcedon. There's I've 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 heard all of it. Um, but the the bottom line is is the council in 451 is what we need to know. Um, there was a creed and a statement that was made that affirmed this, and I want to highlight a couple of um, bits of it. it. There's obviously a lot larger bit, and you can look that up, and it's it, you can get anything you want on the internet. But uh, it says. Jesus is of the same reality as God as far as his deity is concerned, so he's fully God, and of the same reality as we ourselves as far as his humanness is concerned. Fully human, he's fully divine. Super important that we, that we see this. This is, this is what Scripture teaches, but, but this, these are the creeds, these are the Christians' working this out. It goes on to say, listen to this, we also teach that we apprehend this one and only Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, in two natures. And we do this without confusing the two natures, without transmuting one nature into the other, without dividing them into these two separate categories, and without contrasting them according to area or function. This is the orthodox description. Um, so what we can say, what we understand about the natures is that they're not confused. In, in other words, they're, it's not schizophrenic and they are, we can't say that they're combined, that they be, because they, 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 they're still, still separate. Um, we can't say that when Jesus does some miraculous act or some divine intervention or some miracle, it's his divine nature. But then when he gets hungry, it's his human nature. No, he is one person, but he is fully God and fully man. And, and so this is this is super important because, you know, like in John 1 14, where it says the word divine became flesh, human, and dwelt among us, we've seen his glory. The, 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 two, the two natures are there. But it's one person in Jesus that those natures, and they're not confused, they're not combined. It's just that's who, who Jesus is. Um, it says that in 1 Corinthians 2.8, it says that none of the rulers of this age understood what they were doing. For if they had, they would not have crucified. That's something that you can do to a man. It says they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's a divine concept. Scripture's not trying to delineate all these things. We're having to do this. The important thing to understand when we come to the hypostatic union is that Jesus is fully God and that he's fully man, but he is one person with the two natures, but the natures are not confused. They're not combined. He truly is God. He truly is man in one person. And we go, how does that work? And the scriptures are never trying to explain fully how all those things work as much as those are what scripture says um, about, about Jesus. And so I, th I think that the most important thing that I can say to you as a professor um, is that when we hold to a Christology of Jesus and we say, who is Jesus? We say, well, he's fully God. And we have scripture to support that. We say that he's fully human. We have scripture to support that. But we also say that in the one person of Jesus, was the two natures, human and divine. And it's not confused, it's not conflated, it's, it's not schizophrenic, it, it's none of those things. It's one person with two natures, and that has been the historical understanding of who Christ is. 
as far as a person. Now what we're going to have to turn to is we're going to have to turn to how does this God man, how does this God who is before all things and created the world and all those things that they say about Jesus in Scripture, how does he become man? How does he take on the form of man? And we call that the kenosis, and to that we're going to turn. <laughs> 